pray for the Villa Reels as well. Uh, Brother Ray, or Sister Julie, won. I think Brother Ray sent me a text last week or this week and said that both of them had COVID. And, of course, he had heart trouble. How many of you remember that? He's had a heart surgery and heart attack over the last year. He's had heart surgery and heart attack, then heart surgery and so on. So he got so bad with COVID, they took him to the hospital, and he has two blockages, 80% blockages, and they're uh, giving him some medication right now, but may even do more surgery. And all this took place because of COVID. Then Sister Julie has had the COVID, and it was so bad that it was she was just really uh, low. But uh, they got some kind of medicine, and you'll have to look at the note to see what the name of it was. And she recovered very well. But how many of you are going to pray for the Villarreals again? We keep praying for them. Boy, they've had a time. And so we just keep praying for the Villarreals. All right. All right. Let's sing our courses. For, we don't do it much, but let's do it tonight. <laughs> Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and He's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. ladies <clears throat> recently the doctor has put me on a um, medicine called meloxicam and I read those side effects and guess what one of them is yes you said that right <clears throat> the book of Jude we are finish up tonight. This is number 17, and we'll finish up the book of Jude. We have in this book these things, the commencing of the epistle, the characterizing of the apostates, and man, that was a long list of terrible things, the conduct in apostasy, how we should act, and the closing of the letter. Last time, if you remember, <clears throat> I know you're overjoyed. I know you're so excited, you're just about to jump up and shout. But last time, we talked about how to act in the face or in the presence of the apostates in verse 22 and 23. And it says, of some have compassion, was that in the Sunday school lesson this morning or am I dreaming? Was compassion in the Sunday school lesson? Amen. Of some have compassion making a difference. And others save with fear pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Now here's two things that you ought to remember from those before we get to the closing. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
One of the best things to do in the presence of the apostasy that is prevalent today is to evangelize. One of the best things to do in the presence of a, an apostate, a person, is to evangelize. You say, well, are you evangelizing the apostate? That may not be what you can do. You are to evangelize others as well. <coughs> And here's what I think, and I want to boil it down into one sentence. I like to make things simple. If the church is doing what it ought to do, it will be strong enough to withstand apostasy. Amen? If the church is doing what it ought to do, it will be strong enough to withstand apostasy. Apostasy. Remember the seven churches in the book of Revelation. You don't have to turn there. But it appears to me that each of the seven churches in the book of Revelation dealt with apostasy except for one. The church at Ephesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That was the apostates of their church time, the Nicolaitans. But the Lord says that they had left their first love. Now I want you to keep that in your thinking processes. They didn't like the Nicolaitans they were strong against the Nicolaitans, but they left their first love. And then the church at Smyrna. And there were those in the church at Smyrna, and I think these are who the apostates Paul is talking about, or Jude is talking about here in Jude. There are those that say they are Jews, but they are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. That's at the church of Smyrna. And they were faithful, though. The church at Smyrna was faithful, even though they had those apostates. So Smyrna is a church that would be what we should be like, faithful, even though there are those of the synagogue of Satan in our midst. <clears throat> and then there was a church at Pergamos. They had those in the church that held to the doctrine of Balaam. And they had those that held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we discuss that when we preach the book of Revelation. But the Lord tells the church at Pergamos to repent. They were allowing this doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of Nic Nicolaitans to, to have a great influence in their church. And then the church at Thyatira. Now this is an unusual thing. The church at Thyatira was suffering Jezebel to teach. Uh, not the actual Jezebel of the Old Testament, but something similar to that. In other words, licentiousness and this person was teaching and seducing the congregation. And the Lord says that he would kill her children. Strong message there for Thyatira. So here you have these churches of Asia. We call them Asia Minor. And we know where they are according to those uh, maps that we talked about earlier. And then there's a church at Sardis. It was the dead church. But there were a few. A dead church, but a few that had not defiled their garments. In other words, there was this element in their church that was causing defilement, and only a few remained strong and firm. And then there was that church at Philadelphia, and it is the same as the church at Smyrna. Uh, I think it was church at Smyrna. They had th those that were of the synagogue of Satan. They had Jews that say they were Jews, but they were not Jews, but they were of the synagogue of Satan. So that appears two times in the seven churches of Revelation. So there was people like that who were saying they were Jews, but were not Jews. They were of the synagogue of Satan. And I believe that's what Jews are talking about here in this passage of scripture. <clears throat> and But the Lord says to the church at Philadelphia, he said, but there's some that have not denied my name. So he gives Philadelphia an um, accolade or praise and says uh, there have been some that have not denied my name. Now, here's what I'm thinking. We need to get to the point where we are the ones who are the few that do not defile our garment, where we are the ones that do not deny the name of Christ in the presence of the apostate. Then I didn't mention the church at Laodicea. It's the seventh church. And we all know the church at Laodicea is a lukewarm church. But there's no mention of the Nicolaitans, no mention of uh, Jezebel, or no mention of uh, the doctrine of Balaam. <clears throat> and I think you know what the doctrine of Balaam was. The doctrine of Balaam was greed, greed for money. The Nicolaitans 
It was just an unusual group of people that denied the power of God. And uh, it was just pomp and ceremony, you might say. So that, that's, I think that's the original Catholic pattern. But anyway, so here was a pattern in the churches. Those seven churches had a pattern. Only one, there was no mention of the apostates. Well, what's the problem? I see a pattern going down through those seven churches. Here's a pattern. As they were infiltrated by the apostates, they either left their first love, they were either dead, or they were lukewarm. In other words, something changed. Even the ones that battled the apostates had left where they were. Now, I want to give you a thought. It's hard to battle the apostate and keep your focus on Jesus. It's hard to battle the apostate and to keep your focus on Jesus. It's hard to have sweet communion with Jesus when you're trying to fight and argue with or to debate or to at least confront an apostate. I'm not a very brilliant person. You all know that. <clears throat> I can't remember names, etc. And I've been that way for years. But I do have an experience of observing human nature. I do have that. Might not have a lot of intellect, but I have observed human nature for a long time. And I have found this out. Now you listen very, very carefully to me. There are those who are constantly arguing and debating about spiritual things, about biblical issues. And here's what I've noticed about those folks that are continually arguing about spiritual things and biblical issues. They seldom really love Christ. They seldom really love Christ. And they seldom love the church. There are those people who argue and debate biblical issues, but there are those Christians who are constantly in some other kind of argument. Let me kindly say something. If you have to always prove yourself to be right, you are not going to win people to Christ. Can I say that again? If you always have to prove that you are right, you will never win people to Christ. Christ never argued when he won people to himself. He didn't argue with the Samaritan woman. He didn't argue with Nicodemus. He did not argue with Zacchaeus. He did not argue with blind Bartimaeus or any other person that accepted him. Now, I know he was tough on the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he put them in their place. But there are those who have a ministry, and they are called apologists. And apologists do not argue, but they reason. And there's a difference between reasoning and arguing. They reason with those who are lost. The RZIM ministry out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, founded by the late Ravi Zacharias, is one of those ministries of apologists. And they reason with people. And as I have listened to their reasoning with Hindus or other Buddhists or some other religion or just people who are unsaved and unbelievers, uh, university students primarily, as I have listened to them reason with them, I've noticed something. They never argue. They reason their thoughts and views from the Bible, but they always have a loving, compassionate spirit about them as they reason with that person. In other words, their goal is to win the person, and they know that they're not going to win the person by just being up one in the argument. They reason with them out of a spirit of love, not out of a spirit of pride and that I have to be right all the time. 
The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It didn't say, go into all the world and argue the gospel. Amen? Amen? Can I hear an amen? amen. I want you to listen to this <clears throat> article from the Coddles. Uh, I've been getting their prayer letter for a long time. Don't know how I came about it, but uh, somehow or this uh, pastor and missionary is out of Tabernacle Baptist Church, and he knew my dad. And because he knew my dad, I think he picked up on my email or something, somehow or another, and started sending me his letters. So I have his letters every single time they have one. But I want to read just a little bit of his letter. <clears throat> and, and, and I believe this is the way we ought to do it. And we don't hear this much anymore, but I want, to, I want to read some things right quick. Recently, while preaching, he's in Toronto, Canada, Ontario, Canada, I'm sorry. Recently, while preaching to the multitudes on the street, and he's preaching in the street. You say, we don't do that around here much anymore. Well, he apparently does it all the time in Ontario. Recently, while preaching to the multitudes on the street, we noticed a lady who was standing by listening with tears streaming down her face. She listened for an hour and then she came running saying, I want to repent and receive Jesus. How many of you think that's good? I don't think John Caudle did that by arguing in his sermon. I think he just preached Jesus. Right there on the street corner, this precious lady from Hungary. <clears throat> that's, that's a good play on words. She was hungry for the word of God and she was from Hungary was gloriously saved, right on the street. She was full of praise and thanksgiving and attended the next church service where she gave her testimony of salvation. It is our experience as we meet so many from different countries in Canada that God has sent them to the Western world to hear the gospel. Just a week ago, we had a saved Czechoslovakian family <clears throat> to stand and listen to the entire message being preached. They kept telling us over and over how blessed and thankful they were for the preaching of God's word and they would like to visit our church. What a blessing to see the drawing power of the word of God. Rosa from Columbia was recently witnessed to on the street and she has also been attending services. We go to preach and witness one day every week in Toronto. That's where I got Toronto from. <coughs> <coughs> to the second largest area of Jews in North America. By this consistent witness, we have built a community of Jews that come out regularly to hear of their Messiah. Jesus, their Savior, has made sacrifice for their sins. We are having a good, good response and have become acquainted with several rabbis. Pray for Levi and his wife as we see them having more interest and questions about the gospel. The Bible says unto the Jew first. We also reach out to the masses of Toronto as we go out several days each week to preach the word of God. Please pray for Donnie, a precious man who has, we have been witnessing to for a long time. He was very disturbed when tests recently revealed that he had lung cancer. How many of you still listening? Everybody still listening? Here's Donnie comes to him. They've been witnessing to him for a long time. He's got lung cancer. He came to hear the word of God preached and fell under conviction and was gloriously saved at the end of the service. Somebody say amen. amen. <clears throat> and as... Um, what is his name? Paul, what? The rest of the story. What is it? Harvey. Harvey, yeah. Paul Harvey says, and here's the rest of the story. Shortly after his salvation, he was retested, and there was no longer any signs of cancer. Do you believe that? <clears throat> I want to tell you something, folks. Preaching the gospel is not arguing. Amen. It is simply preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and I'm going to say something very carefully. Satan cannot unsave the saint, but Satan can make the saint unsavory. You say, what does that mean? Arguing and proving yourself right makes you unsavory to the lost. It takes your focus off of Christ and puts the focus on yourself. Many believers cannot ward off and stand against the apostasy of this day because they are not strong enough to see the wiles of the devil in his refocus campaign. Now, what does that mean? The devil wants you to refocus on the enemy, the apostate, 
and not focus on Christ. And I want you to be sure of this one thing, that the greatest deterrent to apostasy is evangelism. I want you to get that if you haven't got anything else. <clears throat> we also, the Bible says in Jude, to build up ourselves on our most holy faith. So we must be strong in the days of apostasy. Now we come to the closing, verse 21. Uh, well, not quite yet to the closing, but we're getting closer. Keep yourselves in the love of God, verse 21, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So keep yourselves in the love of God. And then verse 22, and some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. One of the greatest, if not the greatest deterrent to apostasy in the church, get this, one of the greatest, if not the greatest deterrent to apostasy in the church is loving souls and winning them to Christ. Loving souls and winning them to Christ. At the end of this little power packed letter from Jude, we have what is called a doxology. <clears throat> a doxology is a short hymn of praise to God, usually sung at the closing of a worship service. A well-known doxology that we probably all know is praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. In our text, Jude gives a beautiful, blessed, notable, commonly used doxology. It's quoted by ministers some places at the end of every single service, this doxology is quoted. The first time I heard it quoted was at a Bill Gothard seminar. At the first time I heard it quoted at the end of a service. Gail and I went to the Bill Gothard seminar several different times. But anyway, that's been a long, long time ago. And that would probably be in the 76 to 82 range. So anyway, we went to those seminars and Bill Gothard's dad, would get up at the end of the service every time and he would quote this doxology. Our blessing, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever, amen. <clears throat> so for the time remaining, I want us to look at this doxology or closing. Is Jude writing to unbelievers? Somebody answer. Is Jude writing to unbelievers? No. no, he's not. So Jude is writing to believers. And he's saying, now unto him that is able to do, what's the next word? Keep you from falling. Keep you from falling. So he's talking to believers. And he's saying, I'm telling you about the God that is able to keep you from falling. And of course, we know the Trinity, know that Jesus Christ is included. Then it, here is Jude closing this little letter on the apostates. And I don't think he started out with the idea of writing about the apostates. I think he was starting out to write about the common salvation. And then he, something changed his heart. I believe it's the Holy Spirit. But he's talking about the falling of a believer. That means you and me can fall. How many of you believe that believers can fall? They can. You've heard of them many, many times. Some have fallen for Jezebel's teachings, seduction, and all that goes with that. Some have fallen for Balaam's teaching, greed for money. Some have fallen for the Nicolaitan's teachings, which basically would be <clears throat> using the grace of God to live any way you want to live. Can, folks, can I tell you something? The grace of God gives us power to live over sin, not under sin. Amen. And the, the Nicolaitans would say, you know, grace of God lets you do anything you want to do. Well, that's not right at all. So people in churches, even good fundamental Baptist churches, are falling into these categories. Greed, uh, the seduction and sensualness, and then uh, all this... Uh, grace of God being used to give a license to sin. So we have many attributes in this chapter uh, on the apostates, one of which convicted me greatly. Now, I might not fall for 
the seduction of Jezebel. I might not fall for the greed. It's a great temptation sometimes. All of these things are great temptation. And I may not fall for the Nicolaitans, uh, licentiousness from the grace of God. I might not. I say, I know those things are wrong and I won't fall there. But the one that he mentions in this chapter that I fall for is the one I told you about. It convicted me greatly. It's complaining. That, and I don't need to belabor that point. But we don't fall sometimes for the big ones. We call them big. But we do fall. And we fall for the little ones. But is it really little and is it really big and little? They're really not big or little. But we do fall. Some just walk after, live after their own desires. That's Balaamism. Uh, that's just living for your own wants and for your own desire. You fall for that. That's Balaam. Uh, you, you fall for the self-aggrandizement and uh, that's basically the Nicolaitans. Uh, but we fall. There's no doubt that many believers fall, especially, I think, in my case, in the area of complaining. There's a verse that says, many are called, but few are chosen. You remember that verse, I'm sure. It was the Lord's parable as they were, he was inviting people to a wedding feast. And many people didn't come to the wedding feast. And he invited them all. He said, go invite these to the wedding. And they wouldn't come. And then he said, now you go out into the highways and hedges and you find somebody. And that, here we go back to this evangelism. He said, you find somebody and you bring them to the wedding feast. And uh, that's what he told the servants to do. So there are going to be some people who accept the word of God and, and live for God. And there are going to be some people that fall. They're going to hear the word of God. They're going to be saved. But then they fall into these traps. Many are called but fewer chosen is an idea that we get from that. There are plenty of people that are saved. I know thousands of people that claim to be saved. But I also know that there are very few dedicated believers. But may we be the servant that the Lord commanded to go out into the highways and to find and bring those to the wedding. Let's not be part of the crowd that falls. Let's be part of the crowd that is trying to get somebody to Jesus. Adam in the state of his innocence could not keep himself from falling. Nor could the angels keep themselves from falling because many of them fell. And the rest of the saints of God are preserved by the grace of God. And the angels that are left are preserved by the grace of God. If imperfect man cannot keep himself, then who can keep him? God. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Can I say something plain and simple? And this is what the verse says. Only God can keep you from falling. Only God can keep you from falling into those things that we've already talked about. And only God can keep me from falling into complaining. And only God can keep you from falling into those apostate characteristics. Joseph excelled of the biblical illustrator makes the following list of areas in which a believer may fall. The era of doctrine, the era of spirit, lack of love, discernment, belief, humility, uh, outward sin, how low the best may fall, neglect of duty, ignorance, idleness, mindless. Yeah, can I tell you something? I have never seen such a lazy Christian church as I see it today. Just flat out lazy. You cannot find people in churches today. Now I'm saying, I just know every one of them. I know that. But I don't see people working like they used to work for Jesus. Am I right or wrong? I used to see people that was, I mean, they were all out for God. And they would, they would get out and tell people about Jesus right and left. And they would bring people to church. And people would get, you say, preacher, why don't we have people getting saved? Because the church is not going. We're either falling or we're going. One or the other. We're either falling or we're going. There is a quote that says something like this. There but for the grace of God go I. How many of you have heard that quote? It supposedly originated with John Bradford. He was called Holy Bradford because he was so pious. And it was said that 
John Bradford was see people being a criminal being led to the gallows and that, or led to the prison house. And he would say, as he saw those criminals being led to the uh, wherever they were leading them to, he'd say, there but by the grace of God goes John Bradford. And it was the idea that if it had not been for the grace of God, I've got the same evil propensity. I've got the same sin in my heart as that man that's walking to the prison or walking to the gallows. And if it were not for the grace of God, that's where I'd be. Pius John Bradford was burned at the stake for his faith on the 1st of July, 1555, at age 44 or 45. He was a law student in England. A law student now. And he had a friend that would preach to him and befriended him. And soon he became converted, John Bradford, to the Protestant faith. Do you know what I read in, I read in that story, here's what I read. Thank God, you don't know the name, but thank God for that fellow student that preached the gospel to John Bradford. I know John Bradford's name, heard it all my life. But I've never heard the name of that person that won John Bradford to the Lord. Aren't you glad somebody did? Amen? Amen. I'm glad somebody won. He was a great English reformer, and we thank God for it. His name has been called Holy Bradford. But you know what? John Bradford did not fall. John Bradford stayed holy, and right up to his time of execution, John Bradford remained true to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you something. Would you rather die and not fall or fall and die? What would you rather do? Would you rather die and not fall or fall and die? You said, preacher, what do you mean by falling like having an accident? No, I'm asking you this question. I would rather die than to fall from what I know is right. Amen? Amen. Amen. But I want to ask each of you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ at, that keeps you from falling. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling. This is the book of Jude. Who is able to keep us from falling? God. Now, and then it says... In the next part of that verse, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So here's what God does. He keeps you from falling and then he presents you before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Not only is our God and our Savior able to keep us from falling but he is able to present us before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, I want you to get a hold of that a little bit, if you don't mind. When I think of the uh, thought of uh, exceeding joy, I think of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. How many of you remember when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem? Was he excited? Was he full of joy? I mean, he was so full of joy, he was jumping up and down. The Bible says dancing before the Lord. And it's not the dance, the seductive dances of today. But anyway, David was jumping up and down and praising the Lord and bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Now, that's a type. That's a type of what the Lord Jesus is doing for you and for me. He's going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. I don't know all about his glory, but I know one thing. In his presence, there is glory. And that's why we call heaven, and heaven itself is called glory. Amen? I'm glad we're going to glory. Amen? That's where we're going. So I think of David and that exceeding joy. But now imagine Christ. In the Bible, as far as I know in the New Testament, I never see Christ shouting. I never see Christ laughing very much. I know in the book of Psalms it talks about him uh, laughing at the wicked and so on. Yeah. 
Amazing. So anyway, but one of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be giving it, bringing us and presenting us before his, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, do you think he's going to be very quiet? I think he's going to be shouting. I think he's going to be singing. I think he's going to be praising. I don't know about you, but I believe the Lord Jesus Christ one day is going to have a triumphal march of his people, bringing them into the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You think about that just a minute. <clears throat> now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And the last verse. And we're finishing now. This is number 17. We're finishing up the Jude. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Every time I see the word um, about the Lord, anything about uh, the, anything in here, wise God. How many of you see wise God now under to the only wise God. Do you see that? How many ever see wise? Every time I see any word about wise or wisdom, I always think of Proverbs chapter 8. And I don't know if you remember when I preached that message on Proverbs chapter 8, but it is still in my heart like it was yesterday. And I've read Proverbs through every month for the last thousand months, I guess, over and over. Proverbs every month. Every month. On the eighth day, I always read Proverbs 8. Every eighth day of the month. It always happens that way. That's the way the reading schedule goes. And I never have centered in on the wisdom of God. But in the message that I preached on Proverbs chapter 8, I began to think greatly about the wisdom of God. Listen to this just little part of it. Don't want to re-preach that message, but listen to this little part. Now this is talking about the wisdom of God. It says... The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. You see, I believe there's a lot of people that talk about the decrees of God. And maybe God didn't make some decrees. <clears throat> but I believe there's the wisdom of God. I think every single thing that has happened, creation, Mankind, crucifixion, everything that has happened and will happen comes from the great wisdom of God that has been since the beginning. And what should we do to this wise God? Here's what it says we should do. To the only wise God. There's only one wise God. No other, no other God is wise like our God. No other God is wise like the God of the Bible. What should we do to this wise God? We are to... Give him glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Now, you could preach a message on each one of those. Glory, majesty, dominion and power. But I don't have time tonight. But aren't you sure that this one that can keep us from falling, this one that can present us faultless before the presence of his glory, that we should give him all the glory that we can give him, all the power that we can give him, and all the dominion that we can give him, and all the majesty that we can give him. Don't you think we ought to really praise our God? Amen. Let's pray.